Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our webinar series, Critical Issues Facing the Higher Education Sector. My name is Lee Huang, President and Principal of eConsult Solutions. Uh, I'm joined today by Dr. Curtis Gregory, uh, who will be speaking uh, on the topic of organizational leadership in uncertain times. Dr. Gregory, nice to have you uh, in our webinar series today. Thank you, Lee. It's good to be here. I see a few names I recognize out there, so I'm glad this is a webinar. I'm afraid we got to keep people muted. I'm, I'm concerned now. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome questions from the audience. I will start with a few to get the discussion going. Um, as noted, our uh, webinar speaker today is Dr. Curtis Gregory, a community conscious developer of human capital and enabler of access to capital for marginalized communities, an expert in leadership and organizational change, and a talented asset manager, powerful motivator, and staff developer, as well as an excellent communicator. Since 2017, Dr. Gregory has been on the staff of the Fox School of Business at Temple University, where he has taught at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. Currently, he is also uh, the academic director of experiential learning. And additionally, he continues to serve as a project executive with a Fox management consulting practice. Uh, Dr. Gregory, I know it's a dangerous question to ask of an academic to have them talk about their research, um, but I want to start there. Uh, you have, um, in your travels in the academic space, uh, studied leadership in a lot of different industries. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, a question that comes to my mind is, are there certain traits that characterize good leadership, or are there truly no two identical ways to be a successful leader? Yeah, no, there are traits, um, you know, and those traits transition or tr go across not only higher education, but some of the, my experience in bank banking as well as government. So good leadership is good leadership, whether you're leading a Boy Scout troop or, or leading a, a, a major university. Uh, the two traits that I think I'll I'll point out, and they kind of correlate with one another, and that is emotional intelligence and a key component to emotional intelligence is just flat out empathy. Um, so if you look at the different types of leadership styles like transformational leadership style or even servant leadership style, those are the prominent traits that you see are the common threads of emotional intelligence. I think a lot of people interpret emotional intelligence as your ability to read other people's emotions but a key component is your ability to control your own emotions, as well as to exhibit a certain level of empathy. So my research showed a lot of correlations between emotional intelligence and servant leadership style and transformational leadership styles, which are the two key styles for positive change, okay? Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is a concept called situational leadership. And that speaks to a change in approach, your style, your foundational DNA may still be there, but your approach may vary depending on the culture or the industry or the organization that you're managing in. And let me give you an example. Uh, you know, when I was in banking, I had a boss that his favorite way to end the meeting is he would say, my interest in this conversation is now ended. Now in banking, that was, we were kind of amused by it. And there were times where I'd be sitting across the table from him and I would say, yeah, your interest in this conversation has now ended, hasn't it? And he'd stand up and shake my hand, and that was the end of the meeting. I tried that when I came to government. That did not go over well at all. It was like, who is this brutal guy? And little simple things like, I come into a meeting, I've got to leave at 12 o'clock, and I announce I have a hard stop at 12 o'clock, and, and their heads exploded. So even though you might have a particular style, you have to adapt and shift to different situations, different cultures, different um, different industries. Now, you've mentioned an example from banking and then from the public sector. Take us into the institutional sector. You know, the name of the webinar series is Critical Issues Facing the Higher Education Sector. You have administrators uh, who are grappling with uh, a, a very tumultuous time in the industry. Yeah. So how do some of these leadership skills play out in that setting? Well, first, got to have some leadership skills. <laughs> That's a kind of a, a, a bold statement to make. But if you look at the journey or the typical journey of an academic and having uh, gone through the um, 
PhD process myself in obtaining my PhD and I'm almost off my medication from that leave, but I'm getting better. Um, I recognize that there's no point in that journey. Do they talk about your ability to lead or even your ability to teach? It's really all about research and, and a very, very narrow and deep focus about a particular topic of interest. Um, so consequently, if you look at the the progression chart to get to becoming a university president, not saying this is the case in all situations, but the majority of the cases, they work their way up through the rank. They become maybe a department head. And then after they become a department head, they um, get some position in the dean's office and maybe eventually become a dean. So, you know, department head, senior associate dean, dean. In order to become a department head, in for many universities, you have to have tenure. And I remember when I discovered that, I asked, what part of the tenure process allows you the ability to either demonstrate leadership ability or get any training on leadership ability? And there's there's no point in that process that really points to that. So consequently, you get people that might be the best widget maker, for lack of a better term, or the best this or best that, that get flushed in their leadership roles that really have never led before or never gone through any kind of training on, on leadership. Uh, so it's a different different place to be in for for scholars right now, and particularly for leaders in in higher ed. And it's a different culture altogether. And we I don't want to get too long winded with that, but uh, that those are the fundamental I think challenges I see in higher education. Folks that are just joining, uh, this is critical issues facing the higher education sector. Today's topic is organizational leadership in uncertain times, and we're hearing from. Dr. Curtis Gregory from Temple University. Uh, I want to unpack uh, or have you unpack, Dr. Gregory, something that you were just talking about and particularly press on there's a there's an external role and an internal role that university leaders have to hold that they may or may not have been prepared for, trained in, or particularly good at. Uh, uh, some university leaders have to serve as the public face of the institution. Um, and or have to motivate an institution's employees, you know, from the very top to the very bottom. Those are two hard skills uh, to to have uh, contained in one person, uh, let alone uh, uh, folks that may or may not have received any training or experience in that. So how do you reconcile, this is what we're asking of our leaders with how do you get them trained in, in those very important sets of skills, given how diametrically different they are and yet have to be inhabited in one person at one time? Well, I'm a big fan of mentorship. Um, you know, you should have mentors along the way. Now, one of the things when you have a certain level of positional power, uh, there's a tendency to gravitate towards people that agree with you. And let me just own it. I've fallen into that trap myself. I love that person. They disagree with everything I say. But in that maturation process as a leader, I've discovered that, you know, those people that are always disagreeing with you, there's value in those people too. If you can just open your mind to listen to comprehend and stop listening to respond. And, and that takes a certain level of discipline and a certain level of acclimation. Uh, let me just kind of pick on Temple for a second, because, you know, this is the elephant in the room. Our, our previous president just stepped down, uh, Dr. Wingard, and um, it was no secret. The board made that very, very clear that his focus was to be external facing, and he was hired to be an external facing president. And I will assume that the internal um, objectives or internal uh, strategies were implemented either by the provost or maybe the chief operating officer. This is, I, I don't really know. I'm just, just guessing here for a second. Here's what I will say. Even though the board may challenge you to be external facing or, or to focus primarily external, I truly believe you can't be exclusive. You can't be one or the other. There's got to be a combination. You might skew a little bit external in the beginning, but if you see challenges start to emerge internally, You've got to, as a leader, have the ability to pivot and balance that out and at least focus on the internal and the external and find a way to do that. That's kind of what I mean by that situational leadership and that ad adapt adaptability. Even in an environment or in an industry 
that I think we could argue does not have a lot of organizational agility and that being higher education. And I come from an industry banking that truly, you know, emulated a lack of organizational agility. We're slow to change. We're slow to uh, kind of come on board, although things are changing now. Uh, so I think those, th th those are the two things you've got to be able to pivot. You've got to be able to find those people that are not just going to agree with you, not just going to blow sunshine all over you and go, oh, this is great. You're fantastic. All your ideas are, are amazing. But those people you could truly trust externally as well as internally to point you in the right direction. Listen to comprehend, not just listen to respond. It's a great insight, uh, one that is hard to but necessary to apply uh, in our leadership journeys. Uh, certainly open to audience questions, which you can put in the chat. Um, Dr. Gregory, terms are important. And so I want to um, uh, uh, pick out a couple of terms that you've mentioned, uh, which are uh, uh, standard in your line of work, but uh, wanted you to have an opportunity to define these terms and then kind of talk about the terms in the context of uh, universities and particularly universities in a time of uncertainty. Um, you've talked about situational leadership. Uh, you mentioned the phrase transformational leadership as a thing. And I was hoping you could say a little bit more about that, uh, particularly in light of perhaps the need for universities to transform. What does it mean? What does transformational leadership mean? Uh, uh, as a term of art, and what does it mean in in this industry at this time? Well, that's a great question, Lee. So let me start by uh, I guess I'll throw out a couple more terms. One is I delineate between management and leadership. A lot of companies are very very well managed, but they're not always very well led. And what I mean by management is that's just a day by day. Did you do this? Did you do that? Did we move the widgets from here to there? Did you get all the stuff done? Blah 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 blah. That's the supervision or supervisory aspects of, of running an organization or managing a company. But leadership has more to do about positive change and the ability to transform an organization or move a big, big ship in the water in another direction. And that requires a different type of skills. And one of the things that I had to learn as I matured as a manager was to stop managing or delegate that and, and lift those people up to make those decisions on their own and segue from ma managing the organization to leading the organization. There's a certain level of obsolescence that comes along with transferring from being a manager to being a leader. So you're not in the day-by-day decision-making every five seconds. You're more looking long-term strategic. Having said that, uh, transformational leadership does not necessarily address the ethical components of moving the organization in a particular um, direction. You could argue that Adolf Hitler was a transformational leader, but we could all agree that uh, he he did some bad things. You know, I mean, that's not one that would be hard to argue. There's another type of leadership style called servant leadership style that brings in the ethical, spiritual components of transforming an organization where the needs of the organization don't necessarily supersede the needs of the individual. And it's a tricky balance, but uh, that's what's starting to emerge in the literature. And I think um, um, those are the two things I'll just, uh, I'll segregate those out between management and leadership. Um, when you're faced with different situations, your core doesn't really change that much. Your foundational things don't change. And there's a body of research and there's a body of literature around you will sometimes revert back to your uh, foundational leadership style when your back is up against the wall or when you're experienced duress or whatever the case may be. So we've all probably experienced those leaders that have called us into their office or engaged us in a meeting and said, hey, tell me what you think. Tell, tell me what your opinion is about that, about this. I really want you to weigh in. And then as you do weigh in, you find yourself in a debate with that leader. And then after that happens on several occasions, you start asking yourself the question, do they really want my opinion? Or they're really trying to say, how fast can you agree with me? So it gets very, very tricky. We've gone to some leadership classes. We know we're supposed to have an open door policy and engage different perspectives, diversity of thought. 
But then if my behavior is to debate and argue and berate somebody that has a different opinion, then eventually people are going to stop bringing those opinions to you. And mm. when people stop bringing you information, you start becoming obsolete as a, as a leader. That's not mine. I stole that from Colin Powell, so I don't want to get in trouble for that one. <laughs> I want to pick up on that. Uh, for those just joining, this is Organizational Leadership in Uncertain Times. We're hearing from Dr. Curtis Gregory from Temple University. I welcome questions in the chat, uh, which I will review and then lob at uh, Dr. Gregory. But just to pick up on this point, for folks that are on the hot seat, and I really love the differentiation between management and 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 leadership, in uncertain times, people's impulse can be to be managerial. Uh, or it can be to lead. Um, and so, you know, how do you rein in the uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, as as it were, um, and and summon up the moxie to lead rather than to manage? And and I'm trying not I'm I'm not trying to create a false dichotomy between management and leadership, but but I'm hearing that there can be an impulse to management in times where leadership is needed. So how do you identify that that's what's happening and how do you rein that in and, and, and actually practice true leadership? I think time is a significant factor. Now, I will go back to my foundation as a leader was, was made. I cut my bones as a restaurant manager at Pizza Hut. Gives you an idea what my grade point average was like when I graduated from college, you know, so in the fast food industry, in that environment, you're making decisions very, very fast. So you don't get a chance to really pause and reflect and think about those decisions. I did get a chance to plan, but it was very quick. And I think a fundamental difference between those that are managing on a day-by-day -day basis and those that are leader leading is the ability, even while that Titanic is taking on water, to take a take a step back, look at the overall picture. And go, okay, here's what we've here's what we need to do collectively as a group. We need to go this direction. Right now in higher ed, getting back to higher ed for a second, most universities are experiencing a, a, um, in, a crisis in enrollment. All right. Now, depending on how your revenues are flowing in, whether you're relying primarily on tuition or if you've got some endowment money coming in, will magnify how the sense of urgency around that enrollment you can't cost cut your way out of this but how do we generate more revenue in other words how do we get students to come into the university um you know one of the things that i've heard kicked around in some meetings is let's roll out an incentive plan for students to bring students here or maybe an incentive plan for faculty to recruit students and maybe there's a you know, we could design it so that they don't get paid or they don't get paid the amount until they actually sign on the dotted line or make that check to, you know, attend whatever the uh, corresponding university might be. But if you're an organization that hasn't experienced this level of turmoil, this level of change, you may be falling into the trap of just cost cutting and trying to cost cut your way out as opposed to taking a breath, taking a step back and going how can we reverse this trend in revenue? Where are our most profitable students? Are they in-state students? Are they out-of-state students? Are they international students? Where do we really make money and how do we enhance the ability to generate revenue, incentivize all hands on deck to bring people? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have students, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening in higher ed. I wanna come back to something that you said earlier um, and ask you to say more about emotional intelligence. And you talked about the importance of empathy. I, I really like the the um, contrast between transformational leadership, which is about, I guess, movement or action, and servant leadership, which involves values and prioritization. And it seems to me that now you talk about emotional intelligence, empathy, you're talking about the human side. Mm -hmm. And as an administrator faced with so many different financial and operational and logistical challenges, it can be easy to lose the human side of leadership and of being a leader. So I was hoping you could say a little bit more, first of all, define emotional intelligence. It's a phrase that many of us have heard of, uh, but it is a term of art that means something. Uh, so so what is emotional intelligence? And, and talk about it in the context of a university administrator 
um, trying to, to, to navigate the ship through uncertain waters. Oh, boy. So emotional intelligence has, you know, like I said in my opening comments, uh, empathy is a key component, a key variable to emotional intelligence. It has to do with your ability not only to maintain your emotions, but also to read other people's emotions and uh, to navigate accordingly. I, I'm kind of really... All you got to do is run, find Daniel Goldman, find his book. He's the one that he's not the first person to really do research around emotional intelligence, but he's pretty much the one that put it on the map. I, I have to give him credit for that. Um, you know, in, in the days of when I first started in management, there was something called management by walking around. And uh, when they named uh, Ron Anderson as the dean at Temple University, at the Fox School of Business, excuse me, for Temple University, the first thing I observed with him is he managed by walking around. He would just walk around the offices and say, hey, how are you doing? And, and engage students and faculty. And I thought, I like that. I like that. He's talking to everybody. And then COVID hit and we went to remote learning we, you know, at many cases, we might be hybrid or online or whatever the case may be. And I remember reaching out to him because he can't manage by walking around anymore. How do you, how do you engage those people? And I think that's a challenge that a lot of managers are struggling with to this day. And how do you continue to maintain that nucleus of information sharing in a, in a remote or a, a hybrid uh, environment? I wish I had answers, but, you know, th those are some of the challenges faced with your emotional intelligence kind of gets voided out to a certain extent if your only connection with somebody is through a virtual environment. It's it's tough. It's really, really tough. Yeah, I wanted to conclude with any solutions that appreciate the humility of, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer here. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's something that uh, many employers and institutions and leaders are grappling with is is how do you um engage the human element in a in a format that um makes it a little bit more difficult uh, to do that um but i really resonated with something that you said earlier and wonder if you have uh, any thoughts on on remedies um in the academic setting we hire we promote uh in a um scholarly uh, format, um, but are looking for leadership skills, which may not have been broached, let alone kind of intentionally trained uh, upon the people that we're foisting these humongous responsibilities for and asking folks to do this, these impossible jobs. W what is the way forward for preparing a future generation of um, university administrators, college presidents, and other leadership in this industry that is, I believe, only going to become more important as an industry and more tumultuous as an industry. Leadership becomes all the more important, and you, you've, and yet you've identified this this um, inherent flaw uh, between how we on ramp people to leadership and what are the skills that they actually need to be effective leaders. There's a lot of disconnect there. How do you make that connection? Well, I think it starts with the interview and selection process. If you're still asking the same quest types of questions and focus on the same uh, traits and characteristics that you've been focused on for the last 20 years in terms of finding deans or associate deans or university presidents, then you're going to continue to get the same result. If you're not asking those behavioral-based questions that circle around emotional intelligence, you're going to get the same same results if you're still doing the same process. At one point I asked, as we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion in a lot of organizations, I frequently have leaders come up to me and go, I don't know what to do about this, blah, blah, blah. How do we, how do we change the dynamic on diversity, equity, inclusion? And I typically say, well, start with the equity inclusion piece, get that fixed. And then the diversity is just the numbers game. It kind of falls into place. But if you're losing them as fast as you're getting in, it's not going to work. At the core of it, though, is how do you select candidates? Is your pool of candidates diverse? And are the people that are doing the interview diverse? Does it represent the market that you serve? And nine times out of 10, it does not. So that's a problem in itself. Um, right now, it's, it's circling in my head because we've got the election coming up in this region, the mayor election, uh, some city council people and 
probably a few judges I'm forgetting about right now that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. And I hope people will take these thoughts about emotional intelligence and ask those questions. Are do these people can these people bring about change, whoever your candidate might be, whoever you're thinking about voting for? How, why don't we have anything in our electoral process that looks at emotional intelligence or tracks it or measures? There's all kinds of and we can debate whether this test is good or that test is good. I'm not a big fan of testing anyway, because probably because I was lousy at testing sometimes. But there's all kinds of ways to kind of get an idea whether somebody has emotional intelligence or not. And it's, it's the type of person that can really transform this organization and take it into another direction. But if we're all we're asking are questions about their research and publications and um, you know things along that nature, then it, it's we're going to keep getting the same result. I, I take it from your answer. There's a question in the chat about, I mean, there's all sorts of assessments and a lot of employers will use assessments in hiring. Do you support that or is it is is that um, is it hard to suss out what's going to be effective through a you know a 10, 10 question quiz that tells me what my personality type is and how compatible I am uh, being a leader of this institution? I, I don't think it should be a, a silver bullet, like a one stop. That thing is the... If you don't pass it, you're out. But I think it can be a tool. It could be an additional resource, and I definitely agree with that. We test for just about everything. If you want to get into college, you got to pass the SATs. If you want to get to grad school, it's a GMAT. If you want to get to law school, it's a LSAT. I think it's the LSAT. I don't remember what it's called now. If you want to become a medical doctor, you've got to take some kind of board exam. If you want to become an attorney, you got to pass the bar. Um, there's all kinds of testing mechanisms, whether they're written tests or verbal or oral defenses, whatever the case may be. I don't understand why we don't do that in our electoral process, especially when we're picking elected officials. And I think we can add more things, more resources like measuring emotional intelligence to our interview and selection process. All right. Last question. Also in the chat, a lot of universities are faced with some grim decisions, bad news, how transparent should you be to your employees, to your students, to the community about potential bad outcomes that are maybe coming down the pike? Well, you got to make a decision. Do you want to be on the defense or you want to be on the offense? If you decide you don't want to communicate and things always have a way of leaking out, then you're immediately on the defense. Uh, if you don't oh. tell your side of the story before the media does, <laughs> and I know from working in government, if you don't get it out there before Fox News jumps on it, you're you're on the defense and you may never win that battle. So um, they're tough decisions. They're tough they're decisions that revolve around ethics. I talk about ethics in my classes. You know, I don't have a real scientific method for what I do when I come to that fork in the road fork in the road other than ask the question is this something i want my mom and dad to know about is this something i'm comfortable with being on the news and that helps be my ethical guide um as you disclose things try to decide whether it's going to be made public or not i think a big factor is do you want to be on defense or you want to be on the offense uh Thank you for that, Dr. Curtis Gregory, Fox School of Business, Temple University, organizational leadership in uncertain times. Really appreciate everyone spending a little slip of your lunch hour with us on this uh, hot topic. Uh, we will be continuing for the rest of the month, uh, same time of the week, same time of the day. Uh, in this webinar series, Critical Issues Facing the Higher Education Sector. Uh, the video from this session will be posted later this week. Uh, so that you can rewatch and share with your colleagues. Uh, Dr. Gregory, really appreciate your time and insight. I took a lot of notes, um, and I uh -oh. hope that uh, audience members also had a good time. But really appreciate uh, you sharing of your, your research insights uh, in this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, Mark. I see you out there. Go Penn. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd have some you Penn here, people here. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.